بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا من فضلك علما وتعليما إنك على كل شيء قدير وبعد الحمد لله we were finishing up this section right before the next chapter about nature's love for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and there were one, two, three, four very small sections at the end of this chapter. We want to finish those and then go straight into the next chapter, inshallah. So what we were reading from in the last class and before that and before that were various narrations that connect the shama'il to the khasa'is or connect the outer aspects of the Prophet's appearance وسلم, with miraculous gifts and things Allah gave him. So in the last section, or the last class, we were reading some of the narrations that pertain to the khasa'is. And we always keep in mind this distinction between the various sciences within the sciences that pertain to the person of the Prophet At the top of that list, we have the shama'il, which concerns the physical as well as the moral qualities. Then we have the seerah. And we've said before that the ideal way to study these things is to learn the shama'il before the seerah. Because when you learn the shama'il properly, it becomes the lens through which you understand what was going on in the seerah. If you read about all of the events in the seerah, the battles, the expeditions, the struggles, politics, these things, but you don't actually understand properly who the subject of the seerah is, you're not going to get the most accurate understanding of the seerah. So you start with shama'il, and then you have seerah after that. And the third science would be the khasa'is, the khasa'is being those things that are uh, unique. Now the khasa'is can be divided itself into a number of subcategories. You have khasa'is that are uh, particular to the anbiya and the rusul as a collective, meaning things that are unique for them as a community. Then you have the things that are uh, unique to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that not even the previous prophets had. Another aspect of the khasa'is are the unique qualities and favors and blessings given to the ummah of the Prophet and these relate to us but they relate to us because of our nisbah, our affiliation to the Prophet In other words, because you're from the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad you as an Ummah have certain unique things Allah gave you as a community that no other community was given. So that means that all of these khasa'is that pertain to the Ummah are actually his because it's by virtue of our affiliation that we have them. Things like being able to pray anywhere, minus a few exceptions. Uh, being able to, to use dust or earthen matter for tayammum instead of water if you fulfill the conditions. That wasn't allowed for the previous nations. So that is from the khasa'is insofar as it's particular to the Ummah. So that was given to him وسلم, that he in turn gave to us as legislation. Um, another of the sciences that pertain to the person of the Prophet وسلم, would be Dela'ilun Nubuwa or the proofs of prophethood. And that is a sub science because it pertains to the signs or the special favors Allah gave him that were miracles demonstrating his truthfulness. And 
Yeah, that's about it. You could divide the seerah into maghazi and seerah as well, but that's in general the ulum or the sciences. So the narrations we were looking at last week were just some of the general narrations on the khasais. And these are by no means exhaustive. There's a lot more. Imam al-Suyuti has uh, al-Khasais al-Kubra in two large volumes. And prior to him you had Ibn Saba' who has, it's, it's not published, it's a manuscript. But in the manuscript formed, it was over a dozen volumes. Now not all of those narrations are sound, but he collected them from a lot of uh, material. So we left off on page 84. At the bottom of the page, he has the subtitle there, His Intimate Relations, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. He says, Al-Bukhari relates from the chain of Qatada on the authority of Sayyiduna Anas radiallahu anhu who said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam would go round his wives in one hour of the night and day, and they numbered 11. Qutada said, I asked Anas, how did he have the strength? He replied, we used to say that he had been given the strength of 30 men. So there's a narration that mentions the prophets in general being given the strength of 10 men. So the average strength of the average man which you could argue back then was more than the average strength of the man today. Uh, the prophets in general had 10 times that strength that they would uh, display at different times. We have a really clear example of that in the hadith that details the incident when Prophet Musa alayhi salam traveled to Midian. To Midian. When he left because he was being pursued by Fir'aun's forces, he went all the way to Median, and there Allah Ta'ala mentions the story, uh, how he was sitting by a tree, and he was very tired, and he says, Rabbi, inni bima anzanta ilayya min khayrin faqir, whatever good you have, I'm in need of it. And then he saw these two young ladies who were outside of this crowd of men who were surrounding this well. And they were ala istihya, they were modestly staying back, waiting for them to move. By the time the, the men finished drawing their water from the well, they closed the well with this large stone cover to the well. And it would take normally ten men just to move that stone. So when they're when they left, the, now the well is covered. And Musa alayhi salam, the hadith mentions that he single-handedly moved the stone to help the two young ladies fetch the water. Not only that, he also put the large animal skin inside and he lifted it up on his own. And from there you know the rest of the story, right? He, he goes and meets Shu'aib and then the whole thing happens with him getting married and staying there for uh, eight years and completing ten. But that demonstrates the strength. Now this strength here is uh, the strength uh, applied to al-jima'a, or intimate relations. And this is because he has uh, 11 wives, and these wives have huquq, they have rights. And this is from the sunnah of al-mu'ashara bil ma'ruf. So this is a, a unique thing given to him, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, demonstrating his strength on all levels. The next narration is under the subtitle, The Prophet ﷺ was protected from nocturnal emissions. Uh, this ihtilam. Uh, and this is recorded by At-Tabarani, and he relates from the chain of Ikrima on the authority of Sayyiduna Anas and Sayyiduna Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, who said, the Prophet ﷺ never had nocturnal emissions at all, for nocturnal emissions are from shaitan. They are from shaitan. So we know the categories of dreams. You have the dreams that are from Allah, either as warnings or bringing glad tidings. Uh, then there are the dreams that are, they're just mixed dreams from the person's own uh, 
daily life experiences, a collection of images that don't have any real meaning attached to them, sometimes anxieties. And then you have the dreams that are from shaitan, what we call nightmares. But we see from here also that there's a, another category of dream from shaitan that's not a nightmare, but it will be ihtilab. And that normally uh, occurs when the person reaches puberty. But this, happened, this never happened to the Prophet wasallam or any of the previous Prophets as well. So this is from those khasais that are for all of the Prophets and Messengers, not just him. The next one is a very interesting one. And it says, the Prophet wasallam did not yawn. Did not yawn. Al-Bukhari has related in a tarikh so you have Imam al-Bukhari, the compiler of Al-Jami'u al-Sahih, otherwise known as Sahih al-Bukhari. But he has other collections too. He has Al-Tariq al-Kabir, and he has Al-Adab al-Mufrad, right? He has Khalq al-Af'al al-Ibad. So he has other collections. Now the, the standard of the other collections are, is not the same as the standard for al jamiu al-Sahih. So if you find that the hadith is recorded by Al-Bukhari in his Sahih collection, that means it is rigorously authenticated. Right? But if it's recorded in al tarikh Al-Kabir or Al-Adab Al-Mufrad or the other works, it, those narrations don't always have the same standard. So for those narrations, there has to be a proper analysis of the chain. Sometimes they're authentic, sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're hasan. They're not all sahih. But this narration is sound. Uh, and this is in his at tarikh Al-Kabir. Uh, also it's recorded by Ibn Abi Shayba in his Musadnaf, as well as Ibn Sa'ad in his Tabaqat, on the authority of Yazid Ibn Al-Asam, who said, the Prophet Sallallahu never yawned at all. Ibn Abi Shayba has narrated on the authority of Maslam Ibn Abdul Malik Ibn Marwan who said the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi never yawned at all. There's actually a few narrations about this. Uh, these are two. But we have other narrations. For example, the narration in Sahih al-Bukhari where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam says, At-tatha'u min ash-shaytan, fa'idha tatha'a ba'ahudukum, fal-yakdhim mastata'a. He says that yawning is from shaytan. So if any one of you is feeling the onset of a, a yawn, then let him try to control it and suppress it, yakdhim, yani suppress, to the best of his ability. And the mashayikh, they say that, you know, because we... We yawn. <laughs> uh, the prophets didn't yawn. They didn't yawn. Not because they weren't tired. They would experience t- fatigue and tiredness. That's established. Uh, but they never yawned. And some of the mashayikh, they say that if you are feeling the, the, the oncoming yawn, and you have that, you know, you're halfway there, you're almost about to yawn. If you want to stop it, all you have to do is remember this narration, that the prophets never yawned. And this becomes a way of suppressing it on the spot. The problem is we forget. <laughs> You're tired and, and the tiredness causes you to even forget that. But if you happen to remember that the prophet never yawned, it is a way of suppressing your own yawn. Uh, another narration, uh, so the first one is actually Sahih Muslim. The second narration in Sahih Bukhari, it says, "Atathaa min al-shaytan, fa ida tathaa ba ahdukum, fa liyurdu mustataa, fa inna ahdukum ida qala ha dhaik al-shaytan." He says that uh, if any of you, he says yawning is from shaytan, and if any of you begins to yawn, then let him try to suppress it control it, bring it back. Because uh, if one of you says, ha, his here says ha in Arabic, ha, ha, arif, then shaitan laughs at him. Now what is ha here? Ha is the word for the sound that you make when you're yawn. 
oh. When you do that, it says shaitan laughs at you. So, yeah. As best as possible. Yeah. As best as possible. And yeah, so remember that they didn't he didn't yawn and it, it helps to prevent that. Now the next and final section in this chapter is about the sleep of the Prophet. He says Al Bukhari and Muslim have related on the authority of Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha who said, O Messenger of Allah, do you sleep before you have prayed the witr? He replied, O Aisha, my eyes sleep, but my heart does not sleep. They've also related on the authority of Say- Sayyiduna Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu who said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam said, My eyes sleep, but my, but my heart does not sleep. He also said, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, The eyes of the Prophet sleep, but their hearts do not sleep. So there's a lot of narrations like this. And we covered these narrations, I believe, when we did the Shema'il many years ago. And what this means is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam has consciousness in all of his states consciousness so when you when we go to sleep we lose consciousness now we're alive we have hayat but we know that hayat among sentient beings uh, has degrees right the sentience or the hayat of a, a, a starfish is going to be much lower than a human being right even if it's alive. It doesn't have the same level of cognition or consciousness, even if it's alive. And human beings, when they are sleeping, they have less consciousness than they do when they're awake. And this is why you see the connection between sleep and haya, or life, in Ayatul Kursi. Allahu la ilaha illahu al-hayyu al-qayyum. What's the next part of the verse? Neither sleep nor the precursor to sleep, that slumber overtaketh him. So here the Prophet وسلم, by saying that my eyes sleep, my heart does not, means that his body does take rest, but the heart is it remains conscious at a higher degree than ordinary human beings. And that is why from his khasais is that he could go to sleep and wake up and go right to the salat without making wudu. But for everyone else, sleep is one of the things that require or requires making wudu. Of course, there's details in the fiqh about the different posture you take when you sleep, how deep the sleep is. You know, if you're lying on the couch and you're starting to doze off, but you can still hear people talk around you, you're dozing off, but that doesn't break the wudu necessarily. They say in the books of fiqh that if you were lying down and dozing off and you had a sibha in your hand, if you drop the sibha because you're so unaware, yeah, go make wudu. But if you can keep conscious control of it and you're still dozing, then that's not a level that will require you to make wudu. So we know that wudu is required for Rafa'ul Hadath, raising the state uh, that would not enable one to pray or touch the Mus'haf and so on. But sleep itself, in and of itself, is not a Hadath. It's not an incident like breaking wind or uh, relieving oneself, anything like that. But it is, yani Madhannatul Hadath, it is a likely cause of something like that occurring unbeknownst to you because if you're sleeping that could happen you wouldn't even know so for that reason we make wudu but for the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam because his eyes sleep only and not the heart there's still a consciousness there and so the wudu is maintained so that's why he would get up and this highlights something else is very important in our law that okay the default 
the default when you read hadith that describe the actions of the Prophet wasallam, the default is that those actions are applicable to everyone. So he does something, we, we have a standard now of doing it. However, there are some things that he would do that were particular to him and him alone. And it's important that when we study the fiqh we, or in the hadith, we understand what those things are, right? And one would not read the hadith which mentions him uh, getting up and praying without wudu to be uh, a license for us to do the same because that would be khas, it's particular to him, right? So that ends the section on the khasais. Uh, so we come now to the next chapter on page 87. So before we do that, any questions related to what we've covered so far? If not, we'll move on. Alaikum. It's uh, one o'clock. So the next chapter, it's not named, but this section is called Nature's Love for the Prophet ﷺ. And this section is quite long. I think it goes all the way to page 104. So we'll probably have to divide this up into two sections, hopefully not more. And then we get to part two of the work, which is about the asma, the names. Uh, this section is quite simple, quite easy, because it's simply looking at the narrations that demonstrate how the love for the Prophet ﷺ was not restricted to human beings, but it was other things in nature as well. He says, the greatness of the position of the Prophet ﷺ, al-Mustafa, before his Lord, is such that Allah has fashioned all of nature which are not under the laws of the Sharia, ah, such as the rocks, plants, and animals. He has fashioned them upon loving the Prophet ﷺ and obeying him. Allah has made them aware of the prophetic message. This is not a matter that is inconceivable. The Noble Qur'an indicates the awareness of nature and informs us that they glorify Allah Azza wa Jalla. So we could stop here just for a moment and examine two points. Because we want to ground everything we talk about in the foundations. Uh, point number one, is it rationally possible that inanimate objects like rocks, stones, trees could have cognition and awareness? Is it rationally possible? Yes. Rationally possible. Is it stated in the Qur'an anything that affirms inanimate objects having degrees of consciousness or cognition? Things glorify Allah. Things glorify Allah. On the Day of Judgment, the earth is, yeah, it's replaced. يَوْمَ تَبَدُّلُ الْأَرْضُ غَيْرَ الْأَرْضِ it's altered in its state, but the earth is made to testify, right? And it speaks to hadithu. And then the limbs, the limbs speak, yeah. Uh, so these things, uh, although they're inanimate objects, they have degrees of consciousness, and Allah also gives them the ability to speak. So, well, the animals too. The animals testify. So this is rationally possible and it is affirmed bin nusus textually in the Quran and in the Sunnah. And in this life, not everything is subject. Right, exactly. There's the verse that mentions that everything in the heavens and the earth glorifies Allah. Walakin la tafqahuna tasbiha. You however you don't grasp fully their tasbih. So that, that verse is interesting because it doesn't say la tasma uh, because you may hear it, but you don't understand. Imagine if Allah gave you the gift he gave to Prophet Sulaiman alayhi salam. 
and you could understand mantiq at the language of the birds, and you could hear what they're saying. You could hear what the, the bees are saying and the birds and the chipmunks that are scurrying back and forth. Imagine what they would be talking about, right? I'm sure they're talking about where they can find the next acorn or this or that, but they also have their own tasbih. So Allah says, وَلَكِنْ لَا تَفْقَهُونَ تَسْبِيحَهُمْ You don't understand or grasp their tasbih. You still hear it, right? Now there's some things, that, like animals, you hear sounds. Uh, and then there's things that you don't necessarily hear, like stones. But Allah can lift that veil, as we'll see, and people can be made to hear the tasbih of even inanimate objects. So he says here, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam said, there is nothing between the heavens and the earth but that it knows that I am the Messenger of Allah except for the disobedient from the jinn and mankind. This is recorded by Ahmad, al-Darimi and Ibn Abi Shayba. This is a very important hadith because it establishes that foundation and it also establishes the exception. So there's among creation, everything in nature acknowledges the risada of Muhammad Rasulullah. Everything in nature is a mu'min, billah, and acknowledges the risala. Except for two categories of people, or two categories of existence. The jinn, and here it's not just all jinn, because some jinn are believers, but the disobedient jinn, disbelieving jinn, and the disbelievers among mankind. And that's because these creatures don't have taklif, their cognition is whatever Allah gives them, uh, and they recognize it for what it is. But jinn and mankind have, they have this aql and they have accountability to, to accept or reject. It's a different position. So it's kind of nice to think about that because you can go for a nice walk in nature and you're just walking among the trees and whatever birds are flying and the, or, or critters crawling around and you're walking among uh, I don't want to say kindred spirits but you're walking among fellow mu'min umamum amthalukum right Allah Ta'ala says in the, in the Quran that there's not a single dabba creature walking on four wala ta'ir nor bird yatiru bi janahayhi flying with its two wings illa ummum amthalukum except that they are nations like yourselves according to sa'id bin musayyib radiyallahu anhu sayyid tabi'in that verse means that every single uh, uh, he says that uh, because they're like nations uh, those nations have certain qualities, right? Likewise, those qualities are reflected in human beings as well. So he is a kind of indirect inference from the verse that you have people who, who have certain qualities like some of the qualities of those nations in the animal kingdom. So some people are pig-like. Some people are serpent-like. Some people are horse-like. Some people are sheep-like. You know, sheep. You say people are sheep. Like they're taking aspects of the qualities of sheep. Right? So, yeah. So we... This is page 88. Uh, so he says, Therefore, the stones, trees, and the mountains all love the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, and they were joyous upon his noble arrival. Something I, I was remembering earlier today when I read this passage. Which stones of all the stones in the world are the most fortunate? Al-Hajr al-Aswad, number one. After Al-Hajr al-Aswad, what other stones would be the most fortunate stones? Those that he touched. Wama Rameita Id Ramait. You know those. And then after those, what other stones? Bahar. 
you said. Well, that's a mountain, so it's a lot of stones. Okay. Yeah. Would True. How about all of the stones in Medina? Native stones. The native stones of Medina. They're just they're there, you know. It's a part of the, the ancient landmass, the volcanic plains and whatnot. They've just always been there. And they've been in that vicinity where the Prophet them walked. And these are the most fortunate stones. Imagine you could be a stone. You're just, I'm a stone in Medina, you know. And this is why the Fuqaha they mention in the books that it is improper for a person to take a stone from Medina and take it home. You could say, like, oh, I want you know some something to remember Medina by. I'll take a stone from Medina, like, and just put it in my mantle. Uh, you actually shouldn't do that. If it's outside of Medina, okay, fine. But if it's in Medina proper, you shouldn't do it. So we can take from Mecca. It's better to not take either from Mecca, um, specifically the stones of the Jamarat. You, you're not allowed yeah. to. Um, but it, because it's a haram as well, we just leave them. And I, I remember on our last trip, you remember the, 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 one of the guides who was with us, uh, Suleiman, he was a Sudani, but a Saudi citizen. He was telling us about uh, growing up with his father, they lived outside of Medina, and they would go periodically to Medina for ziyara. And the father, would, when he would get in the car, he would grab a stone or two from whatever city they're living in just to bring and drop off in Medina and say, hey, you know, let the stone live there, why not, you know? People think like that, subhanAllah. So those stones are the most fortunate, aren't they? Um, so he says, the stones, the trees, and the mountains all love the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they were joyous upon his noble arrival. They greeted him and even yearned for him. The Prophet sallallahu said, I know of a rock in Mecca which would greet me before I was sent with the prophetic mission, and I still know of it now. And in another narration, it used to greet me during the nights when I was sent, when he received the, uh, the, the mission of Nabuwa and the Risala. So that, that narration indicates that it's not every single stone Every single stone does have that love, but not every single stone is been given that ability to communicate it as such. So he's uh, mentioning a particular stone. It's also, it's also related from Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, who said, we were with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Mecca, and we set off for some place. When we passed between two mountains and some trees, we did not pass by a tree or a mountain except that it said, As-salamu alayka ya Rasulullah, giving salams. And in another wording, we did not pass by a tree or a rock except that it greeted the Prophet sallallahu So this is recorded by Tirmidhi, Al-Hakim, and also mentioned by Ibn Kathir. The city of Medina itself was joyous and became illuminated upon the arrival of Al Mustafa sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sallam. That's why we call it Al Madinatu Al Munawwara, right? The illumined. For it is related by Sayyiduna Anas radiallahu anhu who said, The day upon which the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sallam entered Al Madina, everything became illuminated. And the day upon which the Prophet passed, everything in Al Madina became dark. We had not finished burying the Prophet ﷺ when we began to deny our own hearts. This is recorded by Imam Ahmad and At Tirmidhi in his Shama'il. Now, the phrase he uses, I would perhaps translate it a different way. Uh, he says, when we finished burying him, or we had, hardly, we had hardly shaken the dust from our hands after burying him, hatta ankarna qulubana, until we began to, we rebuked our own hearts. 
Now here he says, deny our own hearts. That's a reasonable translation. Ankarna can mean rebuke or to deny. What it means is that there is such a palpable, clear difference between uh, Medina and their own state during the life of the Prophet wasallam and after his passing. It was discernible to the people. Now, al Medina re- remains Munawwara, but you understand this is a matter of degrees, of people of such high yaqeen and iman who have the lived experience in the company of Rasulullah they have that to compare to. So after his passing, they see a very palpable difference in the state, even though it remains Munawwara, but it, you know, in degrees. And we should understand that properly because you go to Medina now, it's Munawwara. No question about it. But would it not be more Munawwara if you were there walking with him? Of course. So they're comparing and contrasting the, the, those two phases of Medina, the before his passing and after. And that's why he says what he says. Yeah, it's just the physical presence. The physical presence, it's, it's, that's exactly what they're talking about. And we, in the class we gave a few years ago, navigating the eschaton, we mentioned that the very first sign of the Day of Judgment uh, is the Prophet wasallam receiving the Risala, because he says, بُعِثْتُ أَنَا وَسَعَكَ هَاتَيْنِ I was sent along with the hour like these two, and there was a slight space between his fingers. The next sign would be his passing. That would be a sign of the Day of Judgment, because the final messenger. So final in relation to the human story and the existence of this earth. So that's a sign. Now he says, Uhud is a mountain that the Prophet Sallallahu bore witness to its love for him and its love for the believers. This is a mountain that loves us and we love it. So Uhud is outside of Medina. Like we, we see it as Medina because the city is expanded and it's a short drive. But back then, Uhud is outside of Medina, the proper boundaries. So it's still close to them though. And it had a very special relationship with the Prophet Sallallahu He says, in fact, this towering mountain answered the command of the Prophet Sallallahu with humility and obedience. Uhud once shook when the Prophet and his companions were upon it. In a Sahih hadith, it is related from Sayyiduna Anas radiallahu anhu, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam ascended Uhud with Abu Bakr, Umar and Uthman and it began to shake. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam struck it with his foot and said, Stay firm Uhud, for there is only a Prophet, a Siddiq and two martyrs that are upon you. Uhud answered immediately out of love and obedience for his master and beloved Al-Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam. There's other narrations about Uhud, by the way. There's the narrations that mention that Uhud will be, uh, because in the Quran, we have the ayah in the Quran which mentions, يَوْمَ تَبَدُّلُ الْأَرْضُ غَيْرَ الْأَرْضِ On the day of judgment, the earth is utterly transformed and becomes the judgment plain. However, one hadith mentions that Mount Uhud will remain it will not be destroyed in the same way. It will remain and it will be positioned at the gates of Jannah. So that narration illustrates that as people enter through the gates of Jannah, Uhud will be right next to those gates. And once the believers enter Jannah and everyone is entered, Uhud is actually transported and becomes a mountain within Jannah. There's a hadith about this, uh, a sound hadith. So there's a connection that abides not just during this earthly life, but also in the, on the Day of Judgment and in Jannah. So it is a Jannati mountain as well. So now he talks about pebbles. He says, pebbles 
loved the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and were joyous. They glorified Allah in His noble hands and continued to glorify in happiness and love for the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam even in the hands of Sayyiduna Uthman radiallahu anhu. It is related from Abu Dharr and Ghifari radiallahu anhu who said, I saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam in a gathering and in his hands were some pebbles glorifying Allah. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman and Ali were also along with us. Everyone who was in that gathering heard the glorification. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then placed the pebbles into the hand of Abu Bakr and they glorified Allah in his hands too. I mean they can literally hear SubhanAllah or similar phrases. He then passed it to Umar and they glorified Allah in his hands and everyone in the gathering heard this. He then placed the pebbles into the hand of, hands of, hand of Uthman and they glorified in his hands. He then placed it in our hands and no one could hear the glorification anymore. So there's two ways you can understand these narrations. The, the narrations that talk about the tasbih al hasa the glorification of the pebbles. Uh, the first way you can understand them is that they ordinarily and always are engaged in some form of tasbih it's just we don't hear them, right? So this just as animals have their own form of tasbih and dhikr that we don't understand. Likewise, inanimate objects like mountains and pebbles also have their own form of tasbih. However, we don't hear them. But if Allah wills to lift that veil from our hearing, we can hear them. A select number of pebbles or one or many if Allah lifts the veil you're, you're able to hear them that's one way of understanding these narrations the other way of understanding it is that they're just ordinary pebbles and then in the moment being in the hands they began to glorify but I incline to the first view and this is the view of many scholars they say that it, the miracle is not that the stones were glorifying because that is the nature of everything besides human and jinn which have a choice in the matter. Everything in existence glorifies Allah. The miracle lies not in the actual glorification which is their norm. The miracle lies in Allah lifting the veil from the ears where people could hear them. That's the, that's the best way to interpret those narrations. So we covered, we covered trees and stones in general in Mecca and we covered Medina itself and then Uhud and then pebbles. So the, the next paragraph talks about trees. He mentions here a tree trunk also loved the Prophet Sallallahu and attached itself to him emotionally. The, this tree yearned for closeness to him and wept intensely out of yearning for him. This hadith has been narrated through many transmissions and knowledge of its actual occurrence has reached the level of certainty. Many of the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu have related it. So we have in hadith terminology, you have hadith which are ahad, which means that a single hadith, it, you know, there may be multiple riwayat, multiple narrations of the hadith, but each riwayat more or less has the same chain, going back to one or two sahaba. And there's a lot of detail about what constitutes ahad and the different types, but yeah, the most, most hadith are ahad, like this. And that has a consequence for us in matters of aqidah and matters of halal and haram and details in fiqh. The other type of hadith, and a had hadith we mean they're sound, but the other type of hadith is what we call mutawatir, so it's a mass transmission. So you'd have a single hadith like innamal a'amalu bin niyat, right? A hadith that is 
Uh, it's not just going from one companion. Uh, the, well, the most famous mutawatir hadith is مَن تَقَوَّلَ عَلَيَّ مَا لَمْ أَقُولْ فَلْيَتَبَوَّ مَقْعَدَهُ مِنَ النَّارِ Whoever says about me what I haven't said, let him take his seat in the hellfire. That hadith, when you look at all of its chains, you see it's going through multiple sahaba. They're all different sahaba are transmitting the exact same statements. That's what we call mutawatir or a mass transmission. A mass transmission, or a tawatur hadith, mutawatir hadith, gives you absolute yaqeen, it is qat'i, and in terms of its textual authority, it's on the same textual authority level as the Qur'an itself. Because the Qur'an is mutawatir. So this hadith about the, the, the weeping and the moaning of the tree trunk is mutawatir, meaning it was seen and heard by dozens upon dozens of sahaba in a single gathering and they all transmitted it. And what that means is that you know, at that number, it's absolutely impossible that that many people could all conspire to tell a lie. That's what tawatir indicates. Not that a hadith would be a lie. It just means that the level of certainty is so much stronger and it, it, it's just a famous incident. So he says here, after mentioning that, he, he gives the hadith itself. Imam al-Bukhari has related, as have Imam Ahmad, al-Darimi and others, that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, used to give the khutbah next to the tr- a trunk of a palm tree. So uh, this, I'm trying to remember the exact date. It, it, was, it was actually for a while, it was for a while that was the norm. The, before there was such a thing as a mimbar used to stand upon during the khutbah and other public addresses, the Prophet ﷺ would lean on a, a date palm trunk because the pillars of the masjid and the sides were all constructed from these date palm trees. This was a trunk that was still in the ground and it was there and he used to lean on that. The companions then made a minbar for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. As more and more people became Muslim, and the crowds grew larger, someone suggested building a minbar, and someone who had skill in carpentry uh, in the Byzantine area he constructed this minbar of three steps. So when he moved away from the tree trunk and began giving the khutbah, a wailing was heard in the masjid. So the trunk is still there. It's just the minbar is now being used instead. So for all, you know, the first couple of years, this trunk is honored with having the Prophet them lean on it during the khutbah. And all of a sudden the minbar comes in. It's like, no, come on. That's the state of the trunk was expressed and people could hear it. A wailing was heard in the masjid. Some of the companions described it like a baby camel who cries for its mother, while others described it like an ox crying for a cow. Some of the companions were so disturbed by the crying that they too began crying. The Prophet ﷺ descended from his minbar and went to the tree trunk and placed his hand upon it. He stroked it and embraced it until the sound of wailing stopped. So he consoled the tree. He then said to the tree trunk, If you wish, I will plant you in that place where you once were, and you will be just as you were. Or I will plant you in paradise, and you will be able to drink from its rivers, and you and your fruits will grow beautiful, and the awliya of Allah, the friends of God, will eat from your fruits. It was then heard from the Prophet ﷺ that he said, Yes, I have done it. Yes, I have done it. The companions asked about this and he replied that it had chosen to be planted in paradise. In another narration, the Prophet ﷺ said, Had I not embraced it, then it would have cried out of sadness for the Messenger of Allah until the day of judgment, day of standing. He then ordered that the tree trunk be buried under his pulpit. So when you go to the area by the mimbar today, understand that underground, it's still there. 
and it will actually be in paradise like Uhud is. And both of them have that connection in yearning for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Al-Hassan al-Basri, uh, the great scholar, he would relate this hadith and then he would criticize himself and others and say, this is the tree trunk. How can a tree trunk have more emotion, more feelings, and weep for the Prophet wasallam? yet here we are, we don't. Like that's the reflection. And one time uh, Habib Umar bin Hafiz, a great scholar of Yemen, he came to uh, North America for his very first visit. And he was first, I, I, I believe it was Canada was first, yeah. He visited Toronto first, so we, we were there. And at one of these masajid, they said, can you, can you give a talk about you know, Islam's view on the environment? I don't know what they were thinking. Like some talk about being green or something. And he agreed. And people were sort of expecting some talk about environmentalism and Islam. But his whole talk was about this hadith. He said, the, the tree trunk was cared for by the Prophet ﷺ, but ultimately the tree comes to full fruition and its full splendor in Jannah, right? So if you talk about people who are tree huggers, you know, that's the term they use for a certain environmentalist. Well, here the Prophet ﷺ is actually hugging the tree, right? So he does have care for the environment, but it's a care attached to the hereafter. Right. So that was his reflection on environmentalism and Islam. And uh, he said other things too, but that's what I remember from the talk. Uh, so inshallah, I think, because we have two minutes left, I think we'll stop here.